Hello, this is Angela with Parker's Permaculture. I'm sitting in the backyard of my Portland, Oregon permaculture garden here in zone 8B. It is a lovely autumn evening. I'm hanging out under my hazel here. Now, I'm sitting in a part of the garden that is really in permaculture what we would call a zone four. It's an area that I don't visit and I don't use that much. You might ask Angela, how can you have zones in your garden? You only have a quarter acre. My zones are really, really small. So when I say zone four here, I'm talking about a six foot wide area that runs the length of my neighbor's fence. And right next to it is a zone that I would call actually a one, which is this pathway down to my chicken coop where I go to collect eggs every day. So when I have such a small area to work in, I find even, even though my property is not very big, there are paths, there are uh, places in my garden that I utilize on a daily basis or even several times a day. And then there are other areas that I don't visit very often. So they have a higher zone number, a three or a four or a five. This swath here down the fence line is one that I don't visit that often. Now, when we bought this house 13 years ago, the, one of the only things that was here was this hazel that was squirrel planted and I left it because it was so happy. And again, we utilize it mostly for firewood and for stakes. I do get some nuts off of it, but I have to compete with the squirrels for those. So this was here. And then along the fence line, I've just really struggled with what to plant over the years. The first three years, I actually spent uh, removing invasive bamboo all along the fence line, so I couldn't plant anything else. And that was really in some ways a godsend. It kind of destroyed my rotator cuff. Uh, we broke several shovels. It was probably a hundred yard waste bins full of bamboo rhizomes, but we eventually eradicated all of the bamboo. And before people give me grief about it, it was horrible invasive phyllostachys bamboo that never should have been planted here in the first place. while eradicating the bamboo, I had a chance to like feel out the wind and the sun and how I wanted to think about using this space. And this is where I wanna to get to kind of the heart of the video today. When we are talking about how to utilize our space in permaculture, we often create a site map. We often create a grand scheme or plan either by ourselves or by hiring a permaculture designer to do it for us. And there are many, many benefits to that, right? To have a really cohesive plan can feel really empowering and it means that you can create what's called a permablitz where you bring in a group of volunteers or friends and you knock out your whole design in one weekend or a week or two weeks. Where there's a collective effort, you are um, having the collective energy of all of those people, the collective skills of all of those people, and also the collective human power of all of those people. And you are doing what would take an individual months, if not years to do, and you are setting up your permaculture design in a short period of time. That can seem like a really, really good thing. I've helped participate in a number of perma blitzes and I think they definitely have a place in permaculture. What I want to make sure that you all know, what I want to encourage you is that if you have paid for a permaculture design for your property or you've crafted one yourself, I don't want you to feel beholden to that design. I don't want you to feel that you have to follow that design uh, no matter what. I think there can be a lot of pressure to do that, especially if you've paid a large amount of money to have an expert come in and help you. But in permaculture, our designs should be working for us. Our designs should be meeting the needs of the landscape and the people that are using the landscape. So if your design is not meeting your needs, it needs to change and you need to have the freedom to be able to tweak and shift and just rip out whole sections of things if it's just not working, even if it looks aesthetic, even if um, it fits in with some grand scheme that a designer put in or you put in in the beginning. If it's not working for you, I want you to feel empowered to change it. So for me, once we ripped out this invasive bamboo, what I ended up doing was kind of planting a hodgepodge of things. And I just didn't visit this area that much. I knew I wanted to create chicken forage and I knew I wanted to create a space where, um, this is part of my rotational poultry paddock system, where my poultry had plenty of shade in the summer and protection from predators. 
So I stuck some things in here. Honestly, some things I put in because I just didn't know where else to put them and I thought I'll heal this in here and then next spring I'll move it and then I never did. So this was an area that kind of lacked a design altogether. And in the back of my mind, I've had this growing feeling of like, uh, every inch of my space here is precious. I have one quarter acre. That is not very much space, honestly. And because every inch is precious, I feel like if you are on a smaller plot of land, you're forced to really examine every tiny corner that is not working optimally and bring it up to a level of higher functionality. That's what I want to do with this section here is that I want to bring it into a higher level of efficiency and functionality. I want it to work for me and I want it to work for the garden. It's just not doing that right now. So this is where I think it's really important for us as permaculture designers, as people wanting to live a life that's more sustainable that we are not afraid to have a critical eye, that we're not afraid to scrutinize and critique because if we can scrutinize and critique, we can design better. If we kind of turn a blind eye to something and we kind of pretend something is working because we hoped it would work, we're not helping ourselves and we're not helping our system. So if we take a straightforward, direct gaze, take time to observe and see what's not going well in an area of our garden, we can make changes. But if we just kind of say, well, this is in the initial design, doesn't feel like it's going great for me, but I don't really, I don't want to criticize the initial design because some really good designer designed it or because at the time it seemed it was meeting my needs. If it's not meeting your needs now, maybe your needs have changed. Maybe the design wasn't as good a quality as you thought it was. That's not an insult to whoever designed it, be it you or somebody else. It just turns out that once you're living in a system, once you are interacting with it on the ground level, that what was on paper may not work out as well in reality and it's okay to change it. It's okay if over time your needs change and you change your system to fit those shifting needs. Making sure your system is plastic means that you have a system that is always pushing toward abundance. this area here that's not not a peak abundance and it's not meeting my needs and it could it could be better I could design better at the time it did fine for me at the time that I started this project at the time that I finished eradicating the bamboo everything over here was doing okay and I was focusing on other parts of my garden that needed my attention and now this area needs my attention so I want to show you a little bit about what it looks like and what my plans are for the future, which I will definitely be covering on this channel. Uh, it may sound like kind of a, I don't know, eccentric or maybe overly ambitious, or maybe you think it's a great idea. So I would love your feedback about what you think of my, my hopes and my, my vision for this part of the garden. But mostly I just want to encourage you that if you have spots in your garden that like you don't like the way they look, you don't like the way that they function, they maybe functioned for you in the past and now they're just not, they're just not cutting it. Feel free to make changes. If you bought a plant and you spent a lot of money on it and the plant is struggling to survive where you put it, or you just don't like it and it, it just doesn't meet your needs and you think something better would work in that space, make a change. In fact, on the other side of my garden, I'm going to be removing a tree, one of my favorite trees, and shifting it over here to this part of the garden so that I can hopefully in the next couple of years build myself a real studio where our shed is standing. I need to make more room. So I'm actually moving and taking out plants to put in structures, which maybe people who know me might think that that's completely nuts because I'm always cramming in trees everywhere. But what is going to meet my needs for the future is actually having a really good workspace, a really good design space, a really functional space that myself and my kids can use, and maybe a few less fruit trees, or maybe a few fruit trees shifted over to this part of the garden. So let me flip the camera around and talk about what I'm envisioning, and then I would love your thoughts. Okie doke. We're at a place in the evening where the sun is a little weird, but let's go ahead and keep filming. So this is where I was sitting a moment ago down here, and this is the hazel. She's such a beauty. I just absolutely love this tree. Look at these beautiful, big, straight stakes in here. Just gorgeous, gorgeous. So as we look down this row here, this is what I'm talking about. 
this is my zone two over here. And from here to the fence, this is my neighbor's fence. This is my zone four. I've been doing tons and tons of chop and drop and clearing things out. So just be aware there's gonna be a lot of decomposing plant matter on the ground. So in this area, I have like rugosa roses. That's a grape that volunteered I need to remove maybe. There are my sea buckthorn. I have three of them down the row here. And then behind, you can see down here is my chicken coop. And then we just put in a cattle panel trellis yesterday. So this part wasn't really meeting my needs. I found that my high bush cranberry here, which is zombie apocalypse food. I think it tastes terrible, but pollinators love the flowers in the spring, so I keep it. Um, it was kind of falling into the path and it was hard to get back here. To, let me walk you back here, to the chicken coop to get eggs, okay? So what we did is we put in a cattle panel trellis here and we're gonna build a gate out of a pallet to go in front of it. And that way I can control the movement of the poultry from back here out to this part of the garden. Now you can see these big gaps along the fence. Again, look at all my chopping. Okay, so here's my plan for this area. I want to do a hedgerow, an old fashioned English hedgerow. I'm a little bit obsessed with the whole notion of using living, useful food and medicine supplying plants to create a fence. I need a fence that is secure enough to keep my poultry from hopping over into my neighbor's yard should their fence ever come down or be gotten rid of. And a hedgerow is a living, productive space. It's beautiful, it's functional, and it packs a lot of plants into a small area. So you can see here, I have these big holes. I'm thinking I have these thorny, see buckthorn here, Rosa rugosa. I'm thinking I'm gonna pleach all of these and lay a hedgerow. I'm also gonna move one of my sea buckthorn and I'm going to put in Let's pan over here. You can't see it, but I'll put in a picture. I'm going to put in uh, my damson plum, which is also thorny because it's also a great hedgerow plant and I need to move it from where it is. And all along the fence here, I'm going to lay these plants and I'm gonna use stakes from the hazel and I'm gonna create a structure here to create a real hedgerow and make a fence that I hope eventually will be a living four to six foot high fence of useful plants that produce rose hips, sea berries, high bush cranberries, damson plums, hazels. And in that way, I take a space that I haven't used that much that I know I don't visit that often. And I probably really want to be a zone four and not visit too much and make it a space that produces food for me, that produces useful plants for me, and also serves a function because in permaculture, we talk about stacking functions, serves the function of creating a barrier for my livestock while at the same time producing beauty and food for my family. So that's my plan. I'm gonna grow some roses up and over this uh, trellis here, and I'm gonna move more plants into this area. And I wanna share that journey with you all as I do it. Let's see, it's gonna be an experiment. Let's see how, how it goes. But um, my hope is to put in a living hedgerow in this space. So thank you for watching today. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. That would be fantastic and click subscribe. I also wanna say thank you so much to my new patrons. I have several new patrons and y'all make it possible for me to keep making videos and it helps support my family. So thank you, I really, really appreciate you. I also wanna say that if you are not in a place where you are able to become a patron of this channel or um, support this channel in that way, that is totally okay. I don't want anybody to feel pressured. I also just wanna reiterate that the third ethic of permaculture is share the surplus. And we are all giving and contributing in the ways that we can to make this world a better place and to make um, the message of permaculture accessible to everybody. So if you are not in a position to financially contribute, don't stress about it. Enjoy this video, enjoy this channel, and I hope that it speaks to you. I hope that it is informative for you, and I value your feedback just as much as everybody else's. So let's keep living that third permaculture ethic of share the surplus. I'll be back soon. Thanks.